Good morning, everybody. Now, as you can see, I've called this morning's message being Jesus' witnesses. Now, I recently came across an anecdote in a book I was reading that really sits at the centre of today's reading. The author said that a friend of hers told it to her as either third or fourth hand from other friends. But the anecdote's got that ring of truth about it. So this friend, who might be a friend of a friend of a friend, had gone into a jeweler's shop to buy a cross and chain as a gift. And the shop assistant asked, do you, do you want a plain cross or one with a little man on it? I'll repeat that, the shop assistant said, do you want a plain cross or the one with a little man on it? I'll simply say that this statement is a fine illustration of what today's message is about. There's also a quote that explains the central theme of today's reading. The quote discusses the first verse of our reading. It says, Christ uses the rage of his enemies to the spreading forth and enlarging of his kingdom. Now the events we've just had read to us are related in a very straightforward, no-nonsense manner without elaboration. My paraphrase, Stephen's dead. The church is persecuted and believers are scattered away from Jerusalem. Stephen is buried. Believers are imprisoned, while Saul being the driving force, with Saul being the driving force behind their imprisonment. The scattered believers still preach the good news of Jesus as the long-promised Messiah. And Philip is very successful in spreading the good news of Jesus in Samaria. End of story. We could all go home now. Except, of course, there's the unfolding story and the story which is unsaid of what's happening to those early followers of Jesus, the Christ. There's a lot happening in the reading, but the overriding and central message is of Christ using the rage of his enemies to spread the good news of the gospel. And that's exactly what happens. Remember, back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the last recorded words of Jesus just before his ascension into heaven were and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. And so what Jesus said would happen, happened. The believers were scattered out of Jerusalem and into Judea and Samaria. Philip went to Samaria. The witnesses to the truth of, Je of Jesus fulfilling his statement they would, that they would proclaim his message, not only in Jerusalem but beyond. Driven to obey, but driven to obey by the persecution meted out from those who would not believe. God using evil for his and our benefit. I think Luke is masterful in the way he understates things. He writes just so simply and plainly. But he just leaves you hanging, and deliberately so, encouraging you to find out more. He writes very briefly of stories within the overall fulfilment of those last recorded words of Jesus. Stories within the story being more persecution of the believers, the scattering of the believers. Stephen is buried. Saul imprisoning the believers. The scattered believers still preaching their word, telling people about the miracle of Jesus. And Philip preaching in Samaria. Now there's a way of discussing things by asking questions using the four W's. And the four W's being when, what, where and why. So let's go back to the reading using these four W's. The when is fairly obvious. 
These events took place in Jerusalem somewhere around 33 or 34 AD, give or take a year or two either side. With the next W on the list, what, the elements of the story are also obvious. What happens? A great persecution begins on the day of Stephen's death. We know from earlier chapters and Acts that persecution of the believers had already begun. The, persecu the persecutions that Luke talks about in verse 2 had been building up. It hadn't just suddenly erupted. There had been warnings from the Sanhedrin, the Jewish rulers, to the believers. Peter and John had been jailed because of the message of salvation through Jesus they had been openly preaching. Then subsequently, because they didn't stop preaching, the apostles had been flogged. And lastly, of course, Stephen had been killed. So the persecutions the believers were facing were real and escalating. And now the great persecution had begun. And more of what happens. The scattering of the believers begin on the day of Stephen's death. I'll come back to this one in more detail when we get down to why. And more of what happens. Stephen is buried and mourned. And in verse 2, when we read that the godly men buried Stephen and mourned, and mourned deeply for him, this was an act of defiance against the Jewish authorities. It was an act of defiance because Jewish tradition discouraged mourning for those who had been executed, and Stephen had been executed. These godly men, through the very act of mourning, were defying the Jewish authorities and standing firm in their faith. This asks a question, are we willing to openly stand up for our beliefs in defiance of authority? And what also happens? Saul appears. Crucially, Saul enters and then re-enters the story at this time. He first enters the story by approving of the killing of Stephen. His presence is crucially important. He was a passionate person, firm in his belief, and would go to great lengths to uphold what he believed in. When Jesus confronted Saul we, on the road to Damascus, we see one of the most important, if not the most important, conversion from unbelief to belief ever. But in these verses this morning, Saul quickly enters the narrative of salvation through Jesus on the side of unbelief and savagely so. Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Imprisonment was happening led by Saul. Are we willing to be imprisoned for what we believe? Saul, both enemy and then hero of our faith. God is amazing in the way he confronts people, converts people and uses them. I'm sure we'll talk about more about Saul who becomes Paul in the coming weeks. And do you often think about your conversion, about the time when you were born again and how is God using you now? Just as an aside, between Luke and Saul or Paul, they contributed just over 50% of the New Testament, with Luke contributing slightly more than Paul. So here in these verses, we have the coming together for the first time by way of narrative of these two great men of faith. And what also happens? The scattered believers keep talking about what they believe, not only in Jerusalem, but now also in Judea and Samaria. What also happens? Philip goes to Samaria. Persecution is failing. And the next W in, in my list of Ws is where. The where is again obvious. The where is in Jerusalem with persecutions and imprisonment led by Saul. The where of Stephen's burial is probably close to Jerusalem, 
Jerusalem and maybe in Ramallah, about 10 kilometres north of Jerusalem. The way of a scattering of the believers in Judea and Samaria and in the case of Philip, definitely in Samaria. Now we move on to why. The why, as already mentioned, is a key element of these verses. Christ uses the rage of his enemies to the spreading forth and enlarging of his kingdom. The why is to spread the truth of salvation through Jesus throughout Judea and Samaria and then to the whole world, using the persecution of the believers as a catalyst to force them to flee Jerusalem. As I've already said, forcing them to flee meant that the message went with them and where they went, they told people about Jesus. And using a fishing analogy, the net was just cast wider. And these six stories all fit within the classic response you find throughout time when people who believe deeply in something are persecuted because of that belief. They are attacked imprisoned, scattered, forced into exile, but continue believing and over time often come back stronger. And if you think the story of persecution, execution, scattering and strength of belief displayed by these first believers isn't all that relevant today, just remind yourself that Christians are still persecuted for our faith today. The Open Doors organisation supports Christians in those places in the world where this is occurring right now, this morning. If you look at the Open Doors website, there's a common theme running through the persecution that happens. Open Doors reports that Christians are imprisoned, Christians are harassed, Christians are intimidated, Christians are killed, Christian meetings, church, is forbidden, so meetings in secret are necessary. Family members who are not Christians can suffer the same fate as their, relative, as their Christian relatives, and exile is often necessary for Christian believers. An open doors lists 50 countries where this is happening, the worst three being North Korea, Somalia, and Yemen. Open Doors reports on the, what we find in today's reading, death, imprisonment and scattering or exile, here and now in this world. By the way, Indonesia is ranked 33 on this list and we support the Bowen family as missionaries there. Sudan is ranked 10th on the list and through Global Mission Partners we support an orphan school in South Sudan. And just think about what it would be like trying to be a missionary working in one of the top three on the list. Thank God that we are free to worship in Australia though and support missionaries willing to make difficult decisions about working in hostile environments like that. Or are we able to worship freely? Some in in contemporary Australian society, we prefer to see restrictions on what we can and can't preach from the, world of God, from the word of God. Two examples of this type of persecution immediately sprang to my mind, and I've got on my soapbox about these before, but just very briefly, Israel Folau persecuted and sacked from the Australian Rugby Union team by the Australian Rugby Union executive for quoting in context from the Bible and Andrew Thorburn being removed as CEO of the Essendon AFL club because of his Christian belief. So in working through the elements of today's reading, persecution, exile, murder and imprisonment, just remember that they are all in play in contemporary ways in this world of ours today and some of these happened in Australia. Now the why also Philip finds Philip in Samaria. Samaria features in two significant events in the New Testament. We have the parable of the Good Samaritan and Jesus meeting the woman at the well in Samaria. 
In addition, Jesus tells the believers on the day of his ascension that some of them will go to Samaria. And it's worth having a brief reminder of the importance of Samaria. Historically, Samaria became the northern kingdom of Israel and Judah the southern kingdom after the two separated following the death of Solomon when the northern tribes of Israel refused to accept Solomon's son as king. The northern kingdom was conquered in 720 BC by the Assyrians, disappeared and the area became known as Samaria. The southern kingdom, Judea, survived. And Samaritans were hated by the Jews because firstly they had rejected the first, apart from the first five books of the Tanakh, which we know as the Old Testament, the Samaritans had rejected the rest of the Tanakh. The only books they said that were from God were from the first five. And furthermore, they'd interbred with their conquerors and no longer were solely Jewish. It can almost be described as, if, as a family th feud just grew and grew and grew until some, some 750 years later, only hate was left. And this hostility even meant the Jewish people of the time would travel many kilometers out of their way to avoid traveling through Samaria. That is why Jesus' encounter with a woman at the well and the parable of a good Samaritan would have made people, Jewish people, sit up and listen. And in the first instance, Jesus not only purposely travelled through Samaria and then openly met with a Samaritan, which to Jewish eyes was scandalous in itself, but the Samaritan was also a woman, and that would be considered even more scandalous. And John's Gospel tells us that after this meeting, Jesus stayed two days more in that same place and many Samaritans believed when they heard Jesus speak. And this early meeting with Jesus probably goes a long way to explaining the success that Philip, that Philip had when he fled from Jerusalem to Samaria and preached there. Jesus' early ministry there had prepared the Samaritans and so they believed. Philip's healing ministry was a great success in convincing them to believe. And in the second instance, the parable of a good Samaritan, a hated Samaritan becomes a hero, whereas the two Jewish men, a Levite and a priest, were the villains. The Samaritan knew how to love but the two pillars of Jewish society, the Levite and the priest, didn't. What is Jesus telling his audience about loving your neighbour? And when the early believers were instructed to go to Samaria and then because of a persecution following Stephen's death they fled there, we see a very early example of, of preaching Jesus' message of salvation to the Gentiles. God was bringing the lost sheep, the Samaritans, back into the fold. And the Samaritans were Gentiles at, time, at that time, just like the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, and anyone else in that ancient world who were not Jewish. That is, we see God reaching out to the world and now reaching out to us. We also find in the verses this morning a combination of opposites. The opposites of despair through persecution, death and exile, compared to the great joy found in Samaria when the gospel message was ex accepted. Despair contrasted with joy. The despair of, of the believers and then the great joy experienced not only by the new believers, the Samaritans, but the great joy they must, that must have been experienced by the exiled faithful when they saw that the gospel message had been accepted. Now continuing on with why. There's a quote I used at the very beginning this morning. Christ uses the rage of his enemies to the spreading forth and enlarging of his kingdom. And I've used that, that quote because that quote itself 
was written by men who themselves had suffered persecution at the hands of their enemies, had suffered for their belief in Jesus Christ, and some had died because of this persecution. This was in a shameful time of Christian discord in Europe and in Britain. Violent clashes occurring between Catholics and Protestants. People were killed and wars were thought. Mary was queen in England and she was Catholic and was ruthlessly stamping out Protestant Christian beliefs where she could, including those people who adhered to them. And unfortunately, disagreement between Christians still occurs in 2023. But thank goodness, not just as physically violent. But the crime of the men who wrote that quote was therefore being Protestant at a time of Catholic supremacy when Mary was Queen in England. And then even worse, they were translating the Bible into English. After all, I'm paraphrasing a prominent bishop of the time, if the Bible is translated into the common tongue, then every ploughboy may know as much as the priest. Now, I'm just a ploughboy, and I certainly don't, don't know as much about the Bible as Andrew, but isn't it wonderful to be able to personally read and explore God's word in your own language? And that quote about Christ using the rage of his enemies to spread forth and enlarge his kingdom is a text note on verse 1 of Acts chapter 8 from the Geneva Bible of 1560. It's called the Geneva Bible because it was translated into English, the whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, and it was translated in Geneva in Switzerland by this group of exiled Protestant theologians. Exiled because their lives were under threat for their belief in Jesus. Exiled with their lives under threat, threat for wanting to put the word of God into the hands of ordinary people. They knew personally what the rage of Christ's enemies was like. And just like the early believers Luke was writing about, they had continued to spread in exile the true word of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And the Bible we use today in this church, and the Bible that you have at home, is a result of their work. Now, just in conclusion, it's only a brief message, but... These verses that begin chapter 8 of Acts remind us that in the depths of despair, as hard and as improbable as it may seem at the time, there is always hope. The hope provided through Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour. And out of this despair, God will give us this hope. Or in other words, just hang in there. And so that leads me back to where I began this morning, to that little man on the cross. Jesus and suffered and died for us on that cross. Similarly, in these few verses this morning, we see God using suffering and persecution to serve his purpose. And instead of their faith being extinguished, the persecution that Luke tells us about only succeeded in those early believers spreading their faith further and then experiencing the joy that came with this. Spreading their faith further so that all people can become aware of the good news of the gospel and get to know Jesus. And I'll just finish up by saying, thank God for that little man on the cross. And thank God for Jesus.